Hey, it's Benji Cole, son of Al Cole from CBS Radio and host of People of Distinction. The talk that gives an in-depth view of some of the most dynamic, intelligent, and successful people on the planet. Run to our website, peopleofdistinction.org, for more info. Or you can always email me directly at benji at alcoholenterprises.com. And on the line with us today, we have Eric Weidler. We're going to be discussing his amazing book, The Death of the Two-Party System, A Family Millennium. Available for purchase through Amazon as well as barnesandnoble.com. But people, listen, when you head on over to his Amazon and Barnes & Noble page to pick up The Death of the Two-Party System, also look into the other book that Eric has written as well. And that one's called The Little Farm in the Big Valley. Again, both of which are available for purchase through Amazon as well as barnesandnoble.com. And I will say, Eric was brought to our network, People of Distinction, today by some of the best publishers in the business, Parchment Global Publishing. So if you or anybody you know have a book that they'd like moved, well, give yourself the best gift you could possibly give and move it through Parchment. You can find out more information on them and their fantastic team at parchmentglobalpublishing.com. First and foremost, Eric, welcome to People of Distinction, man. Thank you very much for being a guest. How you doing? I'm doing quite well, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely, man. Listen, we're very much looking forward to this. It's an honor to have you as a guest. Thank you for being, uh, thank you for being with us today. Now, before we go into the book, Eric, I know we have a lot of information to cover, but I'm gonna hold off there slightly. Let's start by learning a little bit more about your background, please. So, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Okay, well, I was, uh, I guess you could say, raised in kind of an idyllic. uh, background because I was a Lancaster County farm boy growing up in the 50s, and uh, Mm -hmm. I had quite a bit of work experience, quite a bit of learning experience about all the creatures in nature, I guess you would say, (laughs) working with them. Uh, My father had a dairy farm, but we farmed tobacco and wheat. We farmed about everything, but uh, we didn't have sheep and we didn't have hogs or pigs. (laughs) That's why, even though we uh, Hurricane Hazel blew our pig pen down back in 1954. Oh, wow. So anyway, I was growing up. I wasn't really exposed. We didn't have television until I was in second grade, and then I, you know, watched Sea Hunt and uh, Perry Mason. I guess you would say in those in those 56 and 57 years. Um, I I grew up knowing. Uh, you know, in a big family, and knowing a lot about nature, but it wasn't always ideal. Growing up in the farm isn't always an ideal place to be, especially when it comes to accidents. Um, I had my share of uh, bumps and bruises, and I even had a, a younger brother that was run over uh, in a farm accident. He was run over oh, by a tractor. Goodness, so, so it was sorry. really, um, you look at my life, and I figure, you know, it was quite an idyllic life growing up, but um, it's not all that way. Some of it is tragic. Um, I went to college. I I got a teaching degree. I taught for 39 years in the Exeter school system up here in Berks County, Pennsylvania, and uh, I also joined the National Guard. I became a warrant officer. I, I served in the National Guard for more than 21 years. And I've got around quite a bit. I was at Fort Knox and down at Fort Stewart and quite a few other bases. And I even had overseas duty in Wales. Uh, We had an NCO exchange, and I was part of that. So I had experience uh, overseas, although I didn't see action. Um, Around the time I retired was just the beginning of the uh, just beginning of the Iraq War, 2004. Mm. I have I have five kids of my own. I have a family. I had a mortgage. You know, I I paid that off. I'm 71 years old now, and uh, I guess one could say that uh, you know, what would a retired teacher do but maybe publish a book? Um, but I was really <laughs> excited about the first book I wrote, and I'm also excited about this one because I think it really sends a message for uh, the current political climate and. Uh, perhaps the direction that the country is going uh, in the future. Absolutely. Listen, Eric, first and foremost, man, wow. 
I mean, that that's really the, the main thing that I can say to your background. It's so eclectic, so impressive. First and foremost, whether you saw action or not, thank you very much for your dedicated years of service. Uh, as all of us are here in the United States, we are forever indebted to you and all of your military brothers and sisters that for the sacrifices that they make for our freedoms and really protecting our liberties here in the in, in the states so thank you very much for that also thank you very much for your years and dedication to being a teacher my listening audience knows this already I, I had a very brief stint in education myself i taught for four years but i have a lot of educator friends and family members and one thing that is absolutely certain about that world, for anyone that is involved in it, educators never receive the amount of praise that they deserve. And we know that they don't get paid nearly enough (laughs) for the amount of hats that they have to wear, man. Because listen, you may be assigned to teach history. You may be assigned to teach algebra or biology, whatever the course is. But anybody that's in that world understands that, listen, certain days you're going to need to be a referee. Certain days you're going to need to be a friend. You're going to need to be a therapist. Uh, Educators are are severely taken for granted. So thank you very much for your years of dedication in shaping and molding the minds of future generations, man. It, It is truly a service that is so severely undervalued. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Of course. And listen, Eric, without further ado, man, the the anchor for today's interview is all about your book, The Death of the Two-Party System. So let's jump right in. Eric, what prompted you or compelled you to write the book? Well, as I said before, it was the uh, current political climate, and I, I think I had sort of a message to say about that. Um, the title itself <laughs> uh, would kind of bestow tragedy, you know, the death of the two-party system. Well, you know, that's a norm in uh, in uh, in America here. But uh, I, I think throughout the book, I, I show a lot of hope and a lot of positive things that happen, as well as some of the tragedies over the, over the years. Countries getting together, you know, the United States, what are they going to do? Which party is going to win the next election? That sort of thing. It always seems to be up in the air. Uh, and yet there is a pattern to, you know, one party winning, they, then the next election comes and they'll trade, the, the next party will take its place, that sort of thing. Um, I just I just feel that I felt compelled to say something about the political climate as it is and, you know, write a few things in a delightful manner. I, I put a few limericks at the end of my uh, at the end of my book. I think that are kind of delightful and amusing, um, but significantly enough, the two things that stand out, I think, is the fact that it's both a historical and a futuristic fictional writing. It, it's both, um, and then the way I sequenced it, I, I, again, that's unusual. It's kind of unique because what I do is I start out 500 years in the past over in Europe with European origins. With the Heinz family, of course, it's a fictional family, but I mm-hmm. I have the lineage of the Heinz family uh, from 1500s all the way up to 2500 AD. Um, and what I do is I just take a snapshot, like at, at about the fourth decade. Uh, I start out with 1530, I believe, and then um, the next one I I do. I see I don't do it in line. The next one I do. The next chapter would be 2500 AD. AD. (laughs) I jump way ahead to the future. Now, you can read it in any order you want, but of course then I I keep the pattern going. Then I go 400 years in the past. It would be uh, um, 1630. And then I jump to uh, 2400 AD, 2430, and so forth. Small snapshots, it's about 11 chapters altogether, but it's a back-and-forth sort of thing up until I end in the present time. And um, again, as I say, the the reader can read this in however manner they want. They can skip around back and forth. Well, I think I'll try 1500 A.D. and then go up to maybe uh, the present time. Uh, They can read it in any way they want. So I think those are two things that make the book quite unique. It's the um, 
the fact that it's both historical and futuristic fiction, and the fact that it's um, it's it's put in se- in a non sequential order. <laughs> But there is a pattern, there is a method to the madness, and uh, you'll see that as you read along in the book. (laughs) I love it. I love it. You know, Eric, sticking with this book, The Death of the Two-Party System, now, I I think I can assume this next the answer for this next question but uh, eric you know what happens when you assume right so i'm not going to do that to you i have you here on the line i'm going to come right out and ask what is the message that you are sending to the reader with this book well i would say the basic message is that uh through it all the family survives in good order uh through the years through the centuries actually and uh What's included, especially in the last chapter, which is the present time, um, is just family banter, you know, pleasantries and and, uh, smart aleck (laughs) uh, (laughs) comments in some cases. Mm -hmm. But uh, I I think it adds for pleasant reading and entertains the reader, um, uh, given, you know, the present political situation and, you know, the present living conditions here in the modern era. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, that's contrasted by what was in the past and what's going to be in the future. Now, talking about your title, well, more specifically, your subtitle, A Family Millennium, why did you choose to incorporate that? Well, I think the two party, the death of the two-party system was kind of misleading. Um, it would tell the reader, oh, this is political, this is making a political statement. But really what I'm doing is I'm incorporating just common people, you know, common families, um, what they have to say, you know, in their daily, everyday life. And um, I, I had to add that because it was a, over a thousand years, you know, 500 years in the past, 500 years in the future, even though it was just only 100-year snapshots. Um, mm-hmm. I had to include that because it was a millennium and because I wanted to stress the family element in the in throughout the book. With regards to the book, what party systems are involved besides the usual Democratic and Republican ones? Okay, yeah. Well, we go back to the 1500s, the 1600s. Of course, you had the Reformations. You had Catholics versus Protestants. And I, I kind of bring that to light, uh, you know, at the beginning of the of the book, going back 500 years. And then, of course, you also have royalty uh, versus the serfs uh, in Europe. And then that led, of course, to the, the Thirty Years' War, which really was a religious war. Uh, then in the 1700s, the uh, Indians, the Native Americans versus the pioneers. And uh, I also have a point there with the uh, Cressips War in Pennsylvania in 1730s, um, where you have proprietor versus proprietor. <laughs> Uh, the land grant that William Penn had conflicted somewhat with the land grant that was given to Lord Baltimore. Um, and then in the 1800s, you have the uh, Jacksonians versus the Federalists. Andy Jackson, of course, you know, the populist mm-hmm. president uh, versus uh, uh, the Federalists, which were basically bankers and uh, included the uh, American banking system. In the 1900s, 1930, you had a newcomer in the Socialist Party. Um, with the Depression, capitalism kind of took a back seat politically, uh, and uh, you had the rise of, well, actually you had a three-party system because the Socialist Party uh, came to the forefront, uh, as well as Democratic and Republicans. And then, of course, in the 2000s and the, 2000, uh, uh, the 22nd century, I had those parties kind of, deciding to go independent as opposed to, you know, one versus another. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love it. You know, Eric, would you consider writing more on the subject of politics of the current time? You know, I would. Um, I just felt compelled to write this because of the current political climate. And, uh, you know, I I think if I had something else that was really kind of pressing on my mind, I I just might do that. But uh, right now I don't have, I don't foresee any... uh, more writings in the future, although, um, you know, it's always a possibility. I love it. I love it. Well, people, listen, you know, what else is out there that you can cover in the meantime, while there's another book in the making, hopefully, is his other book called The Little Farm in the Big Valley. 
you know, Eric, quickly, but as we start to close out here, talk to us a little bit more about that book and what uh, prompted you to write it. Well, I was just thinking, you know, years ago, because this goes back about six, seven years, um, my kids, I have five children. They're all grown up. I even have grandkids. I have uh, eight grandkids. And my kids didn't live the childhood that I lived. You know, I, I grew up in Lancaster County Farm, and I was I was really a country boy through and through. You know, but uh, when I was growing up, married, you know, had kids of my own, I was basically a suburban guy like the majority of you know, Americans growing up in the... <laughs> Growing up in the 70s and 80s, mm-hmm. um, and I grew up, of course, in the 50s and 60s, plus I was, you know, wide open spaces out in the country. Um, and I just felt like, you know, my, the coming generation really missed out on something special that I, you know, experienced as a child growing up. And uh, the, the small American farm is no longer in existence. I mean, it's, it's really going out out in something of the past, because even uh, Amish, Amish, the Amish uh, sect down, down in Lancaster County, you ask the average Amish boy what their father does, he'll probably say, oh, he's a, in construction, you know. He's, when, when I was a kid growing up, all the Amish I knew were farmers, you know, or barn builders. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I just felt compelled to, you know, to write something about my childhood. A blast from the past. People, there's so much that is being offered here. You know where you have to go, okay? We've barely scratched the surface. Run on over to Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. Pick up your copy of The Death of the Two-Party System, A Family Millennium. And while you're at it, also pick up his other book, The Little Farm in the Big Valley, both by Eric Weidler. You surely will not be disappointed, and you'll love every minute of it, I promise you. Eric, thank you very much for being a guest with us today, man. It's been truly a pleasure having you on with us on People of Distinction. Oh, likewise. It's been a pleasure for sure.